December 1878. Vincent van Gogh is about to give his life a new direction. He becomes a layman evangelist in Petit Wam. Vincent remains for almost two years in the heart of the Borinage, a blackened miner's enclave on the edge of civilization in the middle of nowhere. In the desolate villages, he preaches for a subdued, unworldly crowd. Those years are hard for Vincent. They mark his life and become a dramatic turning point. What will become of me in the Borinage? Forsaken by God and everybody. Father, mother, Teo. But there is no way back, and the future holds no prospect. They think I'm a failure. I'm the degenerate Van Gogh. Why? I have no one to speak to about this. These are questions that will haunt Vincent for a long time. Meanwhile, the thought of breaking once and for all with a religion he considers to be hypocrite is slowly maturing in his mind. His fervent wish is to return to the origins of Christianity. He dreams about the true belief. I have tried to unveil the theological wisdom. I've read Latin text and Greek signs, which I could not unravel, glimmering before my eyes. But I've never seen people of real flesh and blood in these writings. I want to start all over again, when nobody knows me, where people own but their miserable existence. Those are the houses I want to preach in, to die for life, like Jesus amongst the poor and the lepers, for they are the kingdom of God. On December the 5th, 1878, Vincent's father writes to Reverend Perron, a Protestant preacher in Dour. Dear sir, I refer to a letter sent to you by my son Vincent, in which he asks for work. I urge myself to tell you that he has tried for years to work for the gospel. He does not intend to give up the vocation to, as he calls it, work as an evangelist. I hope he will be able to earn his daily bread through active and honest work under your supervision. On the 30th of March, 1853, Reverend Theodorus van Gogh goes to the town hall of the Brabant town of Zundert to register his son, Vincent Willem. The doctor and the customs official of Zundert act as witnesses. Fate has decreed that Vincent is born without an own identity. He's born one year later, on exactly the same day, as the first born into the Van Gogh family, also Vincent Willem. But he was still born. Every Sunday, Vincent walks past the grave on the way to his father's church. No one knows what feelings this releases in the quiet boy, a slab with his own name on, his own date of birth. There lies his predecessor under a stone. Vincent grows up in the sheltered clerical community. The vicarage is the Zundert variant of heaven. The outside world is not an adventure novel, 
but a place where evil proliferates and prowls about. With his unpredictable willfulness, Vincent is not a Sunday's child, but rather the problem child of the Van Gogh family. Father Van Gogh preaches the word of God, but a lot still remains unspoken in the preacher's family. Duty and order are the key elements. Warmth and affection are not shown. Vincent is the first to leave the family home. At the age of 11, he's sent to a boarding school in Tilburg. Twelve years later, he still feels the loneliness of that little Vincent who was left to fend for himself all alone. In Zundert, the Van Gogh family owns a large vegetable garden which is looked after by the gardener, Arsen. Vincent is very fond of the man who teaches him respect and love for nature. At the time Vincent has already left the house, the gardener, Arsen, unexpectedly passes away. Vincent is then working in a bookstore in Dordrecht. When he hears that Arsen is about to die, he promptly travels home. I will never forget that night. I had only one thought, to be there in time to be able to say goodbye to the old Arsen. One of the few people who took notice of me as a child. I was more attached to him than to my own mother or father. All night, I wandered on the heathland. There was a storm and thunderclaps pushed me on. My heart was pounding in my throat. I was exhausted when I reached Zonda. No one knew what I'd been through. Arson would have understood. But he's gone now. My only friend now's tail. The death of Arson is one of the many shocking experiences in his young life. There seems to be no end to his ordeals. But Vincent keeps his head up. On his way to the Borinage, he draws new energy from the Bible. He wants to prove that the past does not haunt him. He will succeed. And he is determined to secure his future at any price. Because in the Borinage, he will regain his self-esteem. In May 1873, Vincent, who had been working as a clerk for the art dealer Goupil and Sons in The Hague for four years, is sent to England. Goupil is very satisfied with this boy who shows a great interest in art. In London, Vincent meets his first true love. For Eugenie, the daughter of his landlady, he feels unconditioned love. For the first time in his life, the shy, somewhat stern young man gives of his all. I discovered love without knowing what it was. All of a sudden, there it was, and Eugenie was the object of my adoration. My God, I was madly in love. I saw her through a frame of fairy-like colors. She enchanted me with her laughter, her voice, and the shapes of her body brought me into higher spheres. I was in love for the first time in my life. And she lived nearby, and I saw her every day. For the first time in my life, there was laughter in my surroundings. The seriousness of home, the atmosphere of religious obligations, which was always heavily present in our house in Zundert, was gone. I was breathing. There was air and life here. His letters remain optimistic until the spring. In July, he will come to Holland. Before that, he speaks to Eugenie about his feelings for her that I have this deepest feeling for you for somehow now, some time now. And I hoped that you have these same feelings for me too. You know I'm engaged to be married. 
for a long time now. No, I didn't. I consider you just a friend. No more. She has promised herself to another man. Vincent insists that she should break off the engagement, but she refuses. That is his first major heartache. The first unanswered love deeply shocks this oversensitive boy. His optimism fades. He becomes embittered because of the rejection. Vincent becomes uncontrollable can no longer continue to work for a respectable company like Goupil and Sons. When he returns home that summer, the others notice that he has become skinny, quiet, and reserved. His unanswered love has made Vincent another person for his surroundings. I felt like a ship that has lost its sail in the storm. He's obstinate with an explicit tendency for exaggeration. His self-pity constantly is a cause of disharmony with other people. In contrast, the harmony of nature appeals to him. People around him think of him as being eccentric. His authoritarian father and his submissive mother are unable to see through Vincent, nor do they have any feelings for his developing artistic aspirations. It is the summer of 1881. His cousin Kay Voss and her eight-year-old son are staying at the vicarage of Etten. Kay's husband, Christopher Martinus Voss, passed away three years ago. That summer, Vincent and Kay spend hours with each other every day. Kay, who is seven years older than him, fascinates the young, restless soul. She wasn't an extremely beautiful woman. She had these sad features around her mouth, and that's why she fascinated me. With her, I could speak about life. She possessed wisdom that touched and inspired me. I showed her the heathlands of the Vivantian countryside. And without realizing it, I fell in love with her like I'd never fallen in love before. For Kay, I would have gone to the end of the world. But that was uncalled for. As I was close to her, sitting at her feet, and once in a while, I could bring a faint smile on her lovely, sad face. At the end of that summer, I finally ventured to tell her what had been on my mind for so long. When we sat together for the last time, I declared her my love, hesitating at first, then passionately. I thought then, she had to fall for so much love. But she didn't. She shuddered and did not give me much hope. She declined my proposal in an almost relentless manner. It did not leave room for any other explanation. No, never, never more. The very next day, she traveled back to Amsterdam. I never even had the opportunity to tell her I was sorry. Vincent then writes a registered letter to the Reverend Stricker, but he does not await the reply and travels directly to Amsterdam. There, he wants to speak with Kay. He wants to defrost her, as he expresses it. On one night, I was strolling on the Kaiserskracht, searching for the house, and found it. I rang the doorbell and heard that the family was still having supper. I was allowed in. They wanted me to believe that Kay was not there, but I knew she was. Were they put in on an act? Vincent becomes angry when Kay does not show up. 
I stuck my fingers in the flame with the lamp and said, let me see her for as long as I can keep my hand in the flame. But they put out the lamp and said, you will not see her. Vincent remains in Amsterdam for two days. He meets Uncle Stricker a few more times, but it doesn't help. They won't let him see Kay. It is as if she had vanished into thin air. His second great love affair has also ended with a rejection. After the rejection of the proposal, Vincent writes, You see, Teo, I'm tired and weak. Knowing the prejudices of the world, I know what I have to do. I have to withdraw from my class, which has excluded me a long time ago. What is it that makes my heart so restless, that consumes me, and because of which I cannot concentrate? Is it love that haunts me, or the craving for it? How did I become like this? And if human love is not meant for you, but one objective remains, become part of the divine love. Vincent now takes the path that directly leads to religious fanaticism. He's a fundamentalist before the word has ever been invented. And again, his ambiguous feelings towards his father become apparent. He keeps his distance, but at the same time cannot let go of him and loses himself in the projection of the father image. Nothing remains recognizable of the Vincent van Gogh who falls head over heels in love with the ideal woman. Only faith ties him and gives him direction. For faith, he has sacrificed his worldly existence with all its lusts and temptations. He is an unconditional servant of the church. In Ramsgate, he finds employment as a teacher. In Isleworth, he becomes an assistant vicar. After a short intermezzo in Amsterdam, he goes to Brussels to enter into a course at the Institute for Evangelists. As far as I'm concerned, I have to become a fine preacher who has things to say and that are good and valuable to the world. And it is perhaps a good thing that it has taken such a relatively long time of preparation before I was called to speak of these things to others. In January of 1879, Vincent receives through the Missionary Association Comité d'Evangélisation in Brussels a temporary appointment as an evangelist in the Borinage. The Synodal Committee appoints him in Petit Wam. To someone from the pious Zundert, the Borinage is on the edge of civilization. He doesn't know anybody there. He's a stranger in Jerusalem. But he is determined to follow his vocation as a preacher, and for that, he chooses Pitiwam at the end of the world. piece of bread. It's all I ask for. I shall live amongst the poorest of the poor. It will be a relief from the boastings of the bourgeoisie with its hunger for money and power. This is my life. I miss mother and father, but I will chase the thoughts of home through work, very hard work.
Will I fit in here, far away from my ancestors, far from my native ground where I used to play as a child, and where life smiled upon me? At least I thought that it did. Will I be able to live here, amongst these slag heaps in this dominion of death? Can people exist here, or only underground, in the mines where no daylight penetrates? Oh well, rather that than in a petty bourgeois town where life itself cannot stand the light of day. I saw a man today who is more dead than alive. He coughed out his lungs, spat blood, an ashen sputum that he concealed in a filthy rag. I don't believe he'll live much longer, and he won't feel sorry for it. His wife and children watch him slowly waste away, heartbroken. He only suffers. What should become of children who grow up this way, face to face with death? existence these people lead, subterranean workers, as if their daily drudgery must not be seen, as if their work cannot stand the daylight, work that impairs their health, destroys their lungs, for the benefit of major industrialists, capitalism that haunts the earth like a phantom, and he who stands up for the poor becomes a renegade, a disciple of that German Marx the heretic scholar from Trier, who portrayed capitalism as a curse. What else do these people have left in their underground cells, where they pine away like long-term prisoners, but their faith, their trust in Christ, who purifies their soul? In the Borinage, he is not only thrown back into a naked existence, he also learns to find himself and his compassion for the suffering man. He develops an understanding of the daily reality of religion and finds that harsh belief does no longer agree with the needs of the common people. The colors of the Borinage remind Vincent of the black and white of the much admired Dura. There is no diversity. The colors of Vincent's life are black and white. Here in the Borinage, I shall live among the people and preach the word of God. Here I can prove that I'm still capable of something. Vincent prepares his first sermon, inspired by Acts chapter 16. Verse 9. Pendant la nuit, Paul eut une vision. Un Macédoinien lui apparut et lui fit cette prière. Passe en Macédoine et secours-nous. When I tried to describe what the Macedonian was like, with his need and his longing for the consolation of the gospel, and for the knowledge of the one and only true God, how we have to imagine that man to be like the worker with the signs of anguish, suffering, and weariness on his face, but with an immortal soul in search of nourishment that does not perish like the word of God. What is the meaning of a religion if it turns away from man, if it chooses words that float beyond the comprehension of the living, if it does not feel the pain felt by those worldly mortals? Am I capable of convincing people? Am I a herald of God's word, a messenger worthy to convey his word? Am I too humble, possibly? Vincent is alone with himself, wondering what he is doing in these new surroundings. How can I my life rein with the one of my Marcus? How can I bring the boat of Christus over? 
How can I reconcile the sheltered life of the clergyman with the fate of the miners? How will the miner interpret the message of a man who experiences the benefits but not the burdens of a harsh life? What will the message of Christ sound like to the ears of those who slave away for a pittance to bring up the cold that warms rich people's bones? Right from the very beginning of his stay in the Borinage, Vincent identifies with the harsh existence of the miners. He can no longer reconcile the sight of the miners' misery with the sheltered life of the preacher. The miners call him the Christ of the coal mine. Not everybody can tell by looking at him that inwardly he is consumed by doubt. His expression is stern. He fails to bring meaning to his existence as a preacher in the straight jacket of the church. It's not the faith Vincent questions, but his role as a messenger of the sinner. My belief in God is absolute. It is no image, no empty faith. It is what it is. It is true. There is a God who is alive, and he is with our parents, and his eye is upon us. I truly believe that he has a purpose with us, and that we do not entirely belong to ourselves. And this God is none other than Christ, about whom we read in our Bible, and whose word and tale is also deep in your heart. His father visits him unexpectedly, worried about Vincent's fate, not having heard from him for months. I'm very glad that father has been here. Together we paid a visit to the three vicars of the Borinage, walked through the snow and visited a miner's family. We saw the coal being brought up from a mine, called Les Trois Dieux, and Father attended two Bible readings, so we had been quite busy those few days. I think that Father got an impression of the Borinage that he is unlikely to forget, as it would be for anyone who visit this remarkable, picturesque region. Vincent sympathizes with the suffering of the people. Not only does he give away his money, but also his bed, and finally, even his clothes. He freely distributes Bibles and New Testaments. It's one thing to live as the miners, but I also want to be like them and go through what they go through, right where they, in Dante's Inferno, earn their daily living. The sweat runs off their brow in rivulets and mixes with the coal dust. Vincent donates his remaining clothes to the miners. He only keeps a few rags for himself. He becomes one with the miners, and moves into an empty shack, deprived of any form of comfort. At the very bottom of his existence, Vincent finds the inspiration to represent, through primitive means, the misery which surrounds him. He writes in a letter to Theo from the Borinage, I have scribbled a drawing of the miners, men and women, as they walk to the mine in the morning, through the snow, along a path, lined with thornbush hedges, barely visible shadows in the dusk. In the background, the big mine buildings and the coal hills stand out against the sky. 
I'm sending you a sketch so you can imagine it. His religious diligence to bring the Bible to the miners blends with a humane compassion with the miserable of this world. Sometimes he cannot endure the sight of the miners, trapped in the cage of their fate. One day, Vincent goes down into the mine. He gets filthy, black as soot. Nobody will recognize him as the preacher of God's word. Amongst the mine workers, I move through the underground passages, of which the outside world has no knowledge, where an oppressing atmosphere lingers. For six long hours, I was one with those who spend years of their lives beneath the Earth's crust. And all along, there was the threat of the unpredictable forces of nature. I was in one of the oldest and most dangerous mines of the region, called Makas. That mine is in a very bad shape, causing many deaths, either going in or coming out, or through suffocation, or gas explosions, or by underground water, or collapsing passages. And I've seen the children pushing the coal carts, 700 meters below the surface, young children, boys, but also girls with hollow eyes, ignorant of childhood's happiness. It's a dreary place, and at first sight, everything in the vicinity makes a sinister and deathly impression. In this subterranean world, death lies in wait constantly, but nobody talks about it, because talking about it would provoke nature's revenge. As I emerged from the mine, I breathed again and felt the blood stream through my veins. I was alive, but for the miners, this release is short-lived. They have to go back to the darkness of miners' life the next day. Vincent enters into his appointment in Warm with a dedication and earnestness that astonishes and alarms many. Theo visits him once and returns home shocked by his religious fanaticism. As, in gratitude, I think back to your visit. I inevitably recall our conversations. Plans for improvement and change, and motivation, and still, but please do not be annoyed. They somewhat frighten me, because at times when I act upon them, I was more or less disappointed. Many things are thoroughly considered, only to prove impossible to carry out. Vincent becomes an annoyance to the Synodal Committee. They believe that an evangelist should stand above his congregation, not among them. Far from the Borinage, the elders sternly frown upon Vincent's unorthodox preaching. Vincent van Gogh had the gifts of the mind and heart, but not of the word. Man was not created to worship the golden calf or to be a spineless victim to the material world. He does not live by bread alone. I'm convinced that the fundamental living conditions must be in place if we want to call an existence humane. If there is no bread to feed the hungry, then the world of God shall not reach them. The Synod is convinced that Vincent is a dangerous radical. The consequences are merciless. Vincent is defrocked. The man who sympathized with the worst victims of 19th century poverty was dismissed. Vincent discovers the world of difference that exists between word and reality. In the Borinage, Vincent had been through hardship in a place where the church could not avoid to take its responsibility 
and where it usually did. Vincent thought that in the Borinage, you had to make a choice whether you liked it or not. God, where did I fail? What did I do wrong? I've been expelled from the church, and I will not return. A church that measures its faithful on a golden platter of unfounded pity and docility is no longer my church. After this period as an evangelist, Vincent remains for more than a year in the Borinage. He stays with the evangelist Eduard Franck in Quem. Full of energy, he applies himself to another task. He can't change the world, but he can document it, sketching it in charcoal. He writes to Theo, I sit up until late at night, drawing to preserve some souvenirs and to reinforce the thoughts that are the inevitable consequence of things. During his last visit with Vincent, Teo had been quite furious with him over his irresponsibility. Teo told him he was leading a life of leisure at the expense of others. Vincent objects to this. There are, after all, different kinds of layabouts. There are those who don't do anything because of laziness or cowardice of character, because it's in the lowness of their nature. You can pretend I'm one of them if you want. Then there are those who don't do anything, whether they like it or not because they are consumed by a huge desire for action, who don't do anything because they are not capable of doing anything, because they are imprisoned, as it were, because they don't possess whatever it takes to be active, because the ill-fated circumstances condemn them to inactivity. Vincent compares his existence to that of a caged bird. The bird hits its cage with its head while other birds build their nests and have young. In spring, the caged bird knows very well that it has a purpose. It feels that there is something to do, but it can't do it. What is it? The bird doesn't remember very well. It has vague ideas and says, the others build their nests and raise their young and then it hits its cage with its head. But the cage remains, and the bird is furious with pain. Look at that layabout, says another bird flying past. He's leading a life of leisure at the expense of others. 
And still, the prisoner survives. He doesn't die. His inner turmoil remains invisible. He looks all right. He seems fairly cheerful in the sun. But then it's time for migration. Waves of depression. But it is everything it eats, say the children who take care of the bird. But the bird stares beyond the cage at the sky where a thunderstorm threatens and, inwardly, it rebels against its fate. I'm in a cage, I'm in a cage, and I want for nothing, you fools. I have everything I need. Oh, freedom, let me be a bird like the others. In a similar way, an idle person may look like the idle bird. Sometimes people are not capable of doing anything, trapped as they are in some terribly appalling cage. I know there is still deliverance, late deliverance. A reputation, justly or unjustly spoiled. Poverty, a combination of circumstances, misfortune. That's what makes people prisoners. It would still be impossible to tell what it is that encloses you, immures you, seems to entomb you, but somehow you can feel the bars, the walls, is this all imagination, fantasy? I don't think so. And you wonder, my God, will this last? Will it last forever, for all eternity? Just wait and see. Maybe you will see that I'm a worker too. Only there's no way to know beforehand what I will be capable of. In order to escape the pain that this brings about, he resorts to something that used to deliver him from the suffocating atmosphere in Zundet. He starts to draw. With charcoal, he lays down the frail contours of mine workers, men, women, and children. Slowly but surely, his ambition to represent his world on paper takes shape. His drawings are unfit for the salons of the art lovers. They are signals from a different world. He chooses the life that destroys itself. It is the middle of 1880. Vincent van Gogh has 10 more years to live. What do you want? Whatever it is that moves us inwardly, is it also visible from the outside? You may harbor a great fire in your soul, and no one may ever come to warm himself. The passerby sees nothing but a wisp of smoke through the chimney and continues on his way. Well, now, what's left to do? Maintain the fire within, wait patiently. Let he who believes in God wait for the hour which will come sooner or later. Man is here not only to be happy or even to be respectable, he is here to achieve great things for society, to become noble and to surpass the vulgarity through which the existence of almost each individual drags itself. Vincent has found his mission as an artist. Well now, it is precisely in this misery that I have regained the energy and that I said to myself, in spite of everything, I will get back on my feet. I shall pick up my pencil that I threw away in despair and start to draw again. And from that moment on, everything seems to have changed for me. And now I'm underway, my pencil has become obedient and seems to become even more so from day to day.
art of painting is a task that gives inspiration and meaning to life. It is stronger than me. It's true that sometimes I earn my daily bread and that sometimes I receive from a merciful friend. I lived the way I could, as best as I could. It's true that I lost a lot of people's trust. It's true that my financial situation is pitiful. It's true that the future looks quite grim. It's true that I could have done better for myself. It's true that in order to earn my living, I wasted my time and that I want for more, infinitely more than I have achieved. Then he leaves the Borinage, never to return there again. But even if he has lost everything, he has one thing left, the conviction that he will be an artist, an artist overcome by uncertainty, but an artist nonetheless. He will be an artist or he will not be. He'll lay down his life and suffering on canvas. On his departure from the Borinage, Vincent writes Theo, It's a sad prospect that my paintings may never be of any value. The amount of money that painting costs me crushed me under a sense of guilt and cowardice. And it would be good to see this change, if it were possible. Still, the day will come that they will prove to be worth more than the money for the paint and the necessities of life that were put into them. Try to understand the most important of what the great artists, the real masters, have to say through their works of art. That's where God is. One wrote or said in a book, the other in a painting. On the 1st of November, 1880, he writes Theo from Brussels. Don't imagine yourself that I live in luxury here. My food mainly consists of dry bread, some potatoes or chestnuts sold on the corner of the street. But with a somewhat better room, and from time to time a better meal in a restaurant, I will be able to hold out very well. Everything Vincent van Gogh left us is a mirror of his era. An artistic calling marked by a distressed period in his short life. Two years of experiencing first-hand suffering while at the Borinage. Vincent van Gogh was a century ahead of his time. He was a prophet of the 20th century, misunderstood by his contemporaries. It is only a century later 
that the light of his inner world forces itself into our world.